Hi, my name is Eric Hamilton, and I want to tell you today about my research. My research is all about sex, the kind painted by the great masters of the Renaissance, like in this Botticelli. There's so much wonderful going on in this scene, isn't there? Like in the corner, we got this plant clearly just about to flower. It must be so excited for this opportunity it's been waiting its entire life for. And in the background, the bushes and trees putting all of their resources into making seeds and fruits, really the whole purpose of their existence. OK, yeah, I study plant sex. But at least as interesting as all the other kinds, I think this is really personal to me. I think it's really personal to you, too. Because every calorie that I ate today or that I'll eat tomorrow, all the food that all of us will eat for the rest of our lives really comes back to plant sex. Because the product of that are the seeds, the fruits, the vegetables that we rely on. Even if we feed them to animals first, really comes back first to plant reproduction. And as long as humans are going to keep having sex, and by all accounts we are, because there's supposed to be two billion more of us by the middle of this century, then we need to make sure that plants keep having a lot of sex too, actually about 70% more. Now, in elementary middle school, we all learned that animal reproduction requires that the swimming sperm finds its way to the egg cell, female partner. That creates the embryo, which jump starts the whole next generation. Well, it's actually not so different in the plant world, but there are a few key differences. In one, the sperm actually can't move on its own. It has no tail, and it's kind of subject to the whims of its environment. And another, we don't usually call it sperm. We usually call it pollen. Now, when I say pollen, probably the closest association most of us have with that is seasonal allergies, because it makes millions of us suffer. The reason, though, that there's so much pollen out in the world, dumped by the trees and the bushes out into the wind every spring or summer, is because plants, which are literally rooted in the ground, cannot go out and find a mate. So they have to play one of the world's biggest numbers games. Every pollen grain that lands up your nose is a lost cause. They're dumping out so much pollen because they're hoping that just a few grains find the right female partner. Now, in order to do this, the pollen, I like to think about it's kind of on this mythological journey. It faces a lot of obstacles, but it comes equipped with the defenses it needs in order to overcome them. One of them is that as it matures, it deliberately loses the vast majority of its water and ends up looking kind of like a deflated soccer ball here. And this is incredibly stressful for any cell to undergo. And if any of the cells in our body tried to do it, they just wouldn't be able to recover. But what's nice about this is that once you've lost that much water, frankly, not that much else can hurt you. It's a strategy that we're familiar with with another common plant tissue, dry seeds, which under these conditions can survive sometimes for thousands of years. Unfortunately, losing that much water and going out in this suspended animation kind of state kind of just kicks the can down the road. Because in order to come back to life and be a productive cell again, it needs to rehydrate and absorb water. But it's kind of like taking this deflated soccer ball and potentially hooking it up to an overpowered air pump. It could end disastrously. Clearly, pollen needs some way in order to regulate the pressure that's coming in in order to survive this. But like I mentioned, pollen's really on this epic kind of journey. Because even if it does get lucky enough to find a female partner and rehydrate successfully, it's going to find itself really at the top of what to it is an enormous female flower. It's going to need to actually grow up to 1,000 times its original size in order to reach its partner. And it does this tremendously quickly, usually in less than a day. In order to accomplish this feat, it's driven forward, ever increasing, by really strong pressure inside the cell, greater than that inside a car tire. Now, this is really important for being able to grow as quickly as it needs to. But you can easily imagine that if it outpaces itself, it's liable to burst open prematurely. Game over. So clearly, whether it's for rehydrating or for maintaining this level of growth, but also maintaining the integrity of the cell, pollen needs some way in order to regulate the pressure that it naturally experiences. Now, if we were going to solve this problem, and we have, we would invent something like a pressure release valve on a radiator or a steam generator or something. And it would be able to open when the pressure gets too high and close again when it's back down to normal. Well, cells, including pollen, cannot work through metal and valves 
their kind of engineering relies on proteins and works over the span of evolution. So when we were trying to understand just what pollen might come equipped with as a way to control pressure, we turned to nature's pressure release valves, which are these mechanically sensitive ion channels. Now, we actually know a lot about studying this kind of protein from bacteria. So let me talk a little bit about what it looks like from the bacterial point of view and why we think that it could have a role similar to that in pollen. So if we start off here with a happy little E. coli cell growing in an environment that it's used to, and we pluck it up and drop it into a much more dilute solution, that's going to naturally force a lot of water into the cell, really increasing the pressure on the membrane that encloses the cell, potentially bursting it open. Except E. coli comes equipped with one of these mechanically sensitive ion channels that opens in response to that pressure, allowing some ions to flow out, and that's what balances the pressure inside and outside the cell so it can survive this kind of transition. If we imagine zooming out from the cell and looking down on top of the membrane that encloses the cell, these ion channels form protein pores studying the membrane at different places. In response to the pressure, they'll open, allowing ions to flow through. But just as important, they'll then close again, just like an engineered pressure release valve that we might use. So it's this dynamic, cyclical process even, that can control the pressure to the amount that the cell needs. This protein in bacteria is called miscus. And when we went looking, we found that it has cousins in the plant world, including one in pollen that we called MSL8. Now, outlined in yellow, I highlighted the family resemblance between these two proteins, because they're actually related over billions of years of evolution. And that region in yellow is the sort of basic component that allows it to respond to this pressure and allow ions to flow through. But you can see, in those billions of years, MSL8 has added a lot onto the protein. And we just weren't sure if it was still acting in the same way. Well, in order to find out, we went ahead and studied this protein, MSL8, in this tiny mustard plant that we call Arabidopsis. Now, 20 or 25 years ago, this was nothing but a weed. But in the time since, hundreds or really thousands of plant scientists have agreed to all study this plant so that we can learn a lot about simply how plants do plant things. Now, we knew that if MSL8 was going to be useful for pollen at all, it had to satisfy at least one very basic criteria. It had to be in the right place at the right time. So in order to track that, we hooked it up to the fluorescent protein, GFP, so that wherever MSL8 was, we could see it, we could track it. And if it was going to be of any use during hydration or germination, we figured it had to be there before pollen goes on its long journey, as it's maturing. So we dissected a flower, a male flower, where the pollen was developing, and took a look. Each of these little egg-shaped regions is actually an individual pollen grain. And the green signal inside is showing us that MSL8 is being produced, packaged, and prepared for use later. OK, so we checked that off. It was in the right place at the right time. But in order to understand whether it had anything to do with hydration or germination, this growth of the pollen tube, we had to go out and study these processes. Unfortunately, that's really hard to do out in the real world. So we took it back into the lab and created an artificial condition that looked a little bit like it. What I really mean is we took pollen and we dunked it in water. Now, in order to see whether MSL8 had any effect on that, we looked at pollen that normally has MSL8, and then we made a mutant so that doesn't have this gene. I just tried to see if there was any difference between the two. We take the pollen and we just put it in water, and we add a dye that shows us the living cells in green. We see that the normal pollen that does have this gene survives fine. In contrast, pollen that doesn't have MSL8 dies, and it dies fast, and it dies hard. You can easily see it under the microscope. But of course, we're scientists, so we wanted to quantify this and see just how strong the effect was. So here, we took the pollen, and we put it in water for up to two hours, which is basically an eternity for the cell. But it doesn't matter. As long as we keep the pollen in the water, as long as it has MSL8, it survives fine. It doesn't really seem to mind. On the other hand, as soon as we can look at pollen without MSL8 under the microscope, it's dead. And it really just gets worse from there. Now, this doesn't really tell us whether or not MSL8 has any impact on pollen's function in the real world. And that function ultimately comes down to one single thing, which is fertility, its ability to make a seed.
And so we wanted to see if this was true at all, if it had any impact out, say, you know, in the real world. And so in order to do that, we did a couple crosses with our plants. Now one of them was a control, where we took regular pollen, has this gene, and we crossed it to a female partner, where half of the egg cells did have emicillate and half didn't. The reason this is a control is because we already knew that emicillate had nothing to do with the female side of this equation. So we could expect to find that in the offspring, that 50% would carry this mutation through. And that's exactly what we saw. But if we flip it around and use pollen, where half of it has this gene and half doesn't, well, in that case, we recover less than 50% of this mutation, 44%. Now, 44% might not seem like it's that different than 50%. But let me tell you, evolution is brutal. That slight difference over just a few generations will quickly be selected against, and our pollen that doesn't have MSL8 will be no more. So MSL8, this gene, is definitely providing an advantage. And we seem to have some evidence that one way it could do that is protecting against excessive pressure during hydration. But like I mentioned, for our poor pollen on its epic journey, hydration is not sufficient. It has to still grow 1,000 times its original size, and it grows at this incredibly fast clip in order to stay competitive. And it's driven by pressure. It needs the pressure, but that could end dangerously if there's too much. So instead of just dunking the pollen in water, we actually provided the nutrients and signals it needed to germinate and start growing. We use the same vocabulary that we do for seeds. Now, when we look at normal pollen, after a few hours, some of it starts to germinate, kind of highlighted in the blue color here. But the pollen that doesn't have MSL8, it actually bursts open more often than not. I'll zoom in here, and you can see that that gray area coming out of the pollen grain, that's actually it spilling out its guts into the solution. Again, game over. Now, quantifying this, we see that much more frequently than the regular pollen, pollen without MSL8 bursts open. And if it does that prematurely, there is no plant sex and it loses. Now, this was all evidence that MSL8 had some kind of adaptive function. We knew that it helped pollen survive hydration. We knew that it maintained the integrity of the cell as it was trying to grow at that really fast clip. And we knew that ultimately there was a, a real function for it because without MSL8, the fertility and its competitiveness was dropped. Well, we were wondering, uh, we know what happens without any MSL8. What would happen with a little bit extra? Would it provide an extra advantage to the pollen? Well, we decided to take a look by producing a whole range of plants that we forced the pollen to overexpress MSL8. And again, we tagged it with this fluorescent GFP so we could take a look. Now, after a couple of generations, what I was expecting to find was some plants that where 100% of the pollen was expressing this overexpressed version of the gene, tagged with GFP. And so I went looking. The way I set up my crosses, I was expecting that one third, or 33% of the plants that I looked at, would be homozygotes, is what we call them. Except when I actually started looking, I found none, zero, no homozygotes. And I just didn't really know what was going on. Uh, Actually, this happens a lot in my job. Most of my job as a scientist is dealing with something that doesn't work and trying to figure out how to fix it. Now, sometimes it's because the experiment is really hard. Frankly, other times it's because I messed up, you know? And uh, I thought that that was probably what was going on here. Frankly, that's what happens most of the time. I thought maybe I was not using the right seeds, that I wasn't taking care of my plants correctly, that I wasn't using the microscope right. Most importantly, that I might not have been taking good enough notes. So it's usually the most important thing. But I decided to tackle this and find out what was going on. So first of all, I made sure to start taking very good notes, like I should have the whole time, including the number of plants that I was really looking at. Once I got up to looking at dozens of plants and not finding any of them, let alone a third, I thought something might be going on. So I decided to run a couple experiments that I knew how to do and see what I could see. Well, in one case, I took the pollen and I dunked it back in water, easy enough. We know that the normal pollen survives fine under these conditions. And when I looked at the pollen that had extra MSL8, it survived fine too. And when I saw this, it actually made sense to me because I figured that the reason uh, MSL8 was helping pollen survive hydration was relieving excessive pressure. Well, I couldn't think of a reason why having too much MSL8 would be bad under those conditions. OK, so then I went ahead and induced the pollen to germinate. Here, I took regular pollen and allowed it to germinate for a really long time. 
so that basically all of it gets going. And you can see that there's just pollen tubes everywhere. They're just coming in every which way, covering the field of view, forming this mat. You can barely see what's going on. Well, in stark contrast, when I looked at the pollen that had too much MSL8, it was doing nothing. Now, it was alive. We saw that just right before. And I could see under the microscope right here that it was trying to do something. These internal structures were moving around and kind of bubbling together. It was trying to get going, but it just couldn't. Now, at the same time, I started looking at more kinds of plants that had different levels of MSL8. Now, some of them had a lot more MSL8. Some just had a little bit more than normal. And when I looked at what that effect had on germination, I saw a clear relationship that the more MSL8 there was, the less it was able to germinate. And when I took a look at a wider range of plants, I finally did find the homozygotes that I thought were just missing before. Not all the time as much as I expected, but they were at least there. Now, Marty Chalfi, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in 2008 for discovering how to use GFP in cells, the very same fluorescent protein that I was using in order to track MSLA in all of these studies, he gave a talk at our university a little bit after I was working on this stuff. And at the end, he said that if you make uh, an observation and it confirms what you were expecting, then you've made a measurement. But if you make an observation and it surprises you and it contradicts what you were expecting, then you've made a discovery. And I realized, after making sure I took good notes, growing in my confidence in my data and in myself as a scientist, that what I had on my hands was not a mistake, not a product of failure, but actually a discovery, which is that pollen has to balance the amount of MSL8 that it has inside of it in order to stay competitive. Because if it has too little, what we knew early on is that the pressure gets too high. It can burst open. Sure, it might be able to germinate because it has that pressure, but it doesn't matter because it bursts and dies too early. But what I discovered is that you can actually have too much of a good thing, and that if there's too much MSL8 around, it might be intact, but it can't build up the pressure required to burst through the tough outer coat and continue this really rapid pace of growth. It was alive, but lifeless. And so pollen really needs to balance the amount of MSL8 it has to balance the need for the integrity of the cell on one hand and the vitality of the cell on the other. Now, we learned all of this by studying this tiny little mustard weed, Arabidopsis. But we went looking and tried to see, is MSL8 in other plants? Well, we found it in the flowers of corn, and it was there in soybeans, too. We found it in rice and in poplar trees. This is pretty good evidence that MSL8 is likely to be in a whole range of different plants out there. Now, there are almost 300,000 species of flowering plants in the world. I don't know if all of them have MSL8, and I definitely don't know if they all use it in the same way. But I think if we're interested in maintaining this plant sex that we so rely on, that we should go and find out. Because the more that we understand about the process, and the more we understand about how pollen is equipped with a whole range of different strategies, not just MSL8, in order to survive its epic journey, I think we'll be better off. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for joining me with this story. And I'd like to thank all the people listed here who have really helped make this a reality. Thank you.